Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's message, as again, as I said, just kind of sets the framework for this morning's message. We're not going to really dig into it per se, uh, but we will be referring to it uh, throughout as well. It's taken from Mark's account of the gospel, the first chapter, uh, special emphasis on verses 9 through 11, and again, those words read. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is our text, dear family and friends in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's a story that's told about this one particular family that had an above-ground pool in their backyard. And having an above-ground pool, that means that there was not a shallow end for the kids to play in. And so uh, this family, what they did was they regularly had all kinds of life jackets available. So that way when kids who didn't know how to swim uh, would come, they'd be able to put on the life jacket and, and, and be able to enjoy the swim in the pool. And one particular weekend, a whole bunch of families came with a bunch of kids, and, and the kids strapped on the life jackets, and they went out, and, and they were in the middle of the pool, bobbing up and down, having a great time, everybody except for one particular girl. Uh, she was terrified. Uh, she was clinging to the side of the pool for dear life, and, and, and um, uh, over the course of time she would hand over hand make her way around the pool and, and even let go of the side of the pool for a terrifying moment or two before she'd clutch onto it once again. And then as the waves were kind of going, that she got a little upset, a little scared, and then she started to cry. And her mother noticed that she started to cry, so she went over to her daughter and said, Oh, honey, it's okay. You're just crying because you're afraid. But, but soon you, you're not going to be afraid anymore. And the little girl in between sobs said, uh, uh, Really, Mom? Uh, you mean if, if I'm not afraid, I can go out there and do what they do? And, and Mom assured and said, Oh, yeah, you most definitely uh, can do that. After all, they're not really doing anything, she said. She said, all they're doing is allowing the water to hold them up. Well, that was all that she needed to hear, and it wasn't all that long before she was in the middle of the pool with the kids and with her, with her mom as well, having a great time just like everybody else, letting the water hold her up. And really, what a great picture for all of us as we today look at the baptism of Jesus, allowing the water to hold us up. But today, today we're going to do more than just, just look at Jesus' baptism. We're also going to look at, at our baptism uh, as well. We are going to remember the fact that the waters of baptism do, in fact, hold all of us up in all sorts of different difficult situations that come our way. So today we're going to remember and we're going to celebrate that day when, when God's very name was watered upon your head and he claimed you to be his very own. But the sad fact of the matter is that not everybody sees it this way. Not everybody understands and, and appreciates the strength and the power that is found in baptism. As a matter of fact, there are some people who are out there, some churches that are out there that, that think that baptism is, is basically an initiation into the church and that it really isn't any more than just that. Others look at it as a, as a ritual that, that you really just need to do, and, and still others look at it as a, as a declaration that uh, you have decided to follow Jesus. However, today, as we take a closer look at what God's Word has to say to us and the different Bible passages that have been given to us, we're going to find that baptism is far more than just that that baptism, uh, that the water and the word together holds us up at all times. That there is, in fact, and indeed power in the waters of holy baptism, and that it's something that we most definitely should count on and rely on on a daily basis. You see, when we get a better grasp as far as what baptism is all about, we begin to realize that, that baptism, uh, among other things, is really is really a statement about what we believe about God, what we believe that 
God can do, that he does what he says that he can do, and that he can, can indeed work in, in seemingly insignificant things, seemingly insignificant things as simple as water. For you see, the power of baptism is not found in the water, but the power of baptism is found in the water that is connected with God's word. And that's why when we have a baptism that we use just average, ordinary tap water. As Luther explained so well in his catechism, he said, baptism is not simple water only, but it is the water comprehended uh, in God's command and connected in God's word. In other words, uh, through the waters of the holy baptism, the water has this tremendous power as it is connected with God's holy word. And because that's the case, great things can and do indeed happen. And yet some ask, still ask, well, well, how is that possible? And Luther then goes on to explain, he said, it is not the water indeed that does them, but the word of God which is in it and, and with the water, and faith which trusts such word of God in the water. For without the word of God, the water is simple water only and and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is baptism that is a gracious water of life and a washing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So you see, in baptism, we are confessing that God can indeed do what it is that he says that he can do. And God tells us in his word that there is tremendous power that is connected in baptism. And so we believe him because we have his word on it when it comes to baptism. And so what I'd like to do in these next few minutes, uh, this time that we have together here this morning, is to take a closer look at what God's word has to say to us about baptism. It might be helpful, you don't have to, but it might be helpful if you pull out uh, your announcement bulletin that has Bible passages on it. Now, I'm not going to dissect those, but use that kind of as something to write on. Pull out a pen uh, so you can write down some of these Bible passages that will kind of help you when you get home uh, as you make your way and start thinking once again uh, about baptism and the tremendous significance found therein. And and really, one of the best places to start is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. If you're writing that down again, it's Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And these words read, and I know that there's a lot of words up there, but if you write it down, you'll be able to see it in your Bible. It says, Peter replied, so he was preaching, and, and then Peter replied to a question that they had and, and said, he said, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children and for all people who are far off, uh, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, this is a great section of scripture, uh, and, and this is one I would really recommend. You write that down when you go home, highlight this uh, in your Bible. There's a ton of stuff that we could unpack with this passage alone. Could probably do a month-long uh, series on all that is found in this passage. Uh, but what we're going to do is just kind of give you a broad stroke of some of the important messages found in these words. Now, first of all, uh, what are we told that we are to do? It tells us that we are to repent. And then after you repent, then you are to be baptized. And and this baptism is supposed to be done in the name of Jesus. That it's supposed to be done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as you are baptized, you're going to receive this tremendous blessing of the forgiveness of sins. And not just the forgiveness of sins, but you're also going to receive the power that is found in the Holy Spirit. So in other words, just first glance of this passage, it tells us that that we receive some very important stuff when it comes uh, to holy baptism. It's so important that we shouldn't ignore it or take it for granted. We shouldn't overlook it. uh, And and that it's so powerful, so important, that it's really a gift for everyone. Now, here's a side note with this. This is a passage that is oftentimes used by some to suggest that infant baptism is not valid. And they say, see, look, it says what you need to do is repent and then be baptized. An infant can't repent, so how in the world could you suggest that an infant should be baptized when that's uh, clearly not the case here in Scripture? And, and, you know, at first glance, as you look at these uh, passages, I guess you could say almost out of context, yeah, it makes sense. But when we put this section of scripture in context, we see that Peter was preaching to a crowd of people. These people were listening to what it was that Peter had to say, and they said, well, uh, this is all great, but what is it that we need to do in order to be saved? What is it that we need to do have some of this? Peter said, well, to the crowd, said, okay, well, what you guys need to do is you need to repent, 
and then you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and then you're going to receive the forgiveness and, and that. And he goes, oh, by the way, he says to them, this promise, guess what? It's not only for you guys, but it's also for your children and for all people who are far off. So in other words, he's saying for you who are, are old enough to listen and, and understand this, you guys are the ones that need to repent and be baptized, but uh, your kids are also included in this promise uh, as well. And then uh, it's also interesting that in this section of Scripture, uh, that at the beginning, it's found in the imperative form. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, when Peter said, repent and be baptized, being in the imperative form, it's kind of like saying, repent now, be baptized now, do this in the name of Jesus now. And, and, and if any of you have sat through my adult information class, you know, a lot of times they'll say, repent now, be baptized now, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You want to get this done ASAP. So it's not something we want to put off for later, but we, we need to act and we should act uh, immediately. And, and we do not want to delay. So again, uh, there's great power and it's invited and included for everyone. And then the next passage, it kind of builds on this, is from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And it says, And, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, uh, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit uh, of our God. You see, the awesome thing uh, about baptism is that through the working of the Holy Spirit, you then are sanctified. Uh, now, that's the $20,000 theological word of the day where it basically is saying, as you are baptized, you are sanctified, you are made holy then in God's eyes. And, and, and so this transformation takes place uh, in you and through you. But the great thing is that this transformation takes place not because of anything you have done, not because of any decision that you have made, but this transformation takes place because of what God has done for you and in you and, and through you. And that's because your sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, in the blood of Jesus. And that's what's so great about our understanding of holy baptism, that baptism isn't just a, a nice ritual, or we're not just going through the motions when we do this. It's, it's not about us when we are baptized, but it's about God working in us, God using the waters of holy baptism connected with God's word, bringing us into his family. And as we are brought into his family, then our sins are indeed forgiven. And, and because that's the case, uh, that helps us, our baptism helps us when we are facing some challenging and extremely difficult times in our lives because it really reminds us, baptism remi really reminds us who we are and, and, and whose we are. To help uh, illustrate what it is that I'm talking about, there's a story that's told about William Howard Taft's great-granddaughter. There's the family. Uh, you got to admit now, he really had a great stash, didn't he? Okay, but, but William Howard Taft's great-granddaughter uh, in third grade was told that she needed to write an autobiography. And so she got to work, and she went on, she said, My great-grandfather was President of the United States. My grandfather was a United States Senator. My father is an ambassador, and I am a brownie. See, in other words, her family helped identify who she was. Could not the same thing be said about us as part of being part of the family of God through the waters of holy baptism? See, baptism in baptism, God claims us to be his own. We then are part of his family through this waters of holy baptism, and that reminds us who we are, that we aren't just somebody who's out there blending into the crowd uh, and so nobody can tell a difference whatsoever, but that we are people who have been redeemed in the blood of Jesus, people who live under the umbrella of God's forgiveness, and that makes all the difference in the world. This is made perfectly clear in our next passage, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, uh, where this section of scripture reads, again, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, where it reads, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You see, baptism does play an important role as far as who we are. 
It's, it brings us into God's family, and as we are brought into God's family, then we are to clothe ourselves with Christ. And as we put Christ on us, that's going to have an impact on, on what we say and what we do and where we go and the decisions that we make. That means that people, when we're out there uh, in, in the real world, people are going to see us and they're going to see that we are different. Not different, boy, kind of odd that way, but rather that you stand out different, your, your morals, your values, your, your ethics are different than the way of the world. As our clothes say something about us as an individual, so also should our baptism say something about us, who we are and, and what it is that we believe. But as they say on those uh, infomercials, but wait, there's still more. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Uh, we are told, it says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, as we read just a little bit ago. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in the newness of life. In other words, <clears throat> we receive all the blessings and all the, the benefits that are connected with Christ's death on the cross. So as he died, so also did our old sinful self die. And as Jesus was raised from the dead, so also have we been raised to a new life in Christ so that the waters of holy baptism continue to hold us up uh, and, and raise us up to a position, to a level, to a place that we would never be able to reach on our own. And another great passage is from 1 Peter 3, verse 21 and 22. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. Uh, and, and now just before this passage, it's talking about Noah and his family being saved from the flood uh, by the ark that was built. Then, verse 21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, again referring back to Noah and that, said, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So for those who say that there's really not all that much in baptism, you have to ignore this passage. And friends, we cannot ignore this passage. It clearly says baptism now saves you. There is power that is found in baptism. As the water held up the ark, saving Noah and his family, so also does the water of baptism hold us up and save us from the flood of sin uh, that is all around us and threatens to bring us down every single day of our lives. You see, baptism tells us who we are that we are redeemed children of God, and that we then will be able to live with him throughout eternity uh, in heaven because of what he has done for us through that sacrifice that Christ made on the cross on our behalf and through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Another passage from Titus chapter 3. And I'll tell you, there are so many other passages that could take you well into the afternoon uh, looking at all those passages uh, yet today, but we're not going to do that. There's only one more that I want to share with you here today, one that uh, you're probably wondering, how did I not even start out with this? We didn't start with it, we're going to end with it instead. From Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, just as Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, uh, we are told, and Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, being held up by the water, we want others to likewise be held up as well, so that they may experience the same joy, the same comfort, same encouragement that we do. And by remembering our baptism, we do just that. As we are told in that passage to go and make disciples of all nations. How good it is, is it not? How good it is to know that when we're down, when we're discouraged, when, when we're depressed, that the water still holds you up. That when there are problems in your home with your spouse, with your kids, or yeah, with your parents as well, guess what? How good it is to be reminded that the water holds you up. When everything seems to be going wrong at work, at school, it's just one frustration after the next, and nothing seems to be going right, how good it is to be reminded that the waters of holy baptism hold you up. 
when sadness fills your lives due to a, a, a loss or, or a sickness or whatever it may be, it's good to be reminded that the waters of holy baptism hold you up. Yeah, when, when you feel all alone, when you're all by yourself and it seems like the whole world is against you, it's great to be reminded that the waters of holy baptism holds you up. Friends, it's my hope that as we have you know, done a quick walk through this, uh, this doctrine, this teaching of holy baptism, uh, that you receive comfort knowing that, that God's word has a great deal to say to us about baptism. Pastor Shiwi and I were talking about this just a little bit earlier, that uh, this year we had 45 baptisms. Uh, last year we had 20, uh, about 28. So almost double, not quite. And what a, what a blessed year this has been with all those baptisms there. And, and as a baptism takes place in worship, as we remember our baptisms, we receive a great deal of comfort as well because it's a great reminder of what it is we believe, who it is that we believe in, and what it is that God has called us to be doing. It's my prayer that the Lord will continue to bless you throughout this tremendous gift that God has given us in the form of baptism. In his name, amen. And now, may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We continue.